All right, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. It's so I see a few of you, you're welcome to have your cameras on. It's okay if you wanna have me off. I understand bandwidth and uh, I can see your faces. So if you choose to have them on, that's wonderful. Helps me read the group a little bit. I know we're virtual and we're a small group. So that's good. This would be an interactive session. Um, again, my name is Amy McGovern and I was the district reading specialist in Wausau for many years. Um, we just wanna mute everyone. Yep, thank you. Um, and I am currently working with CISA 9 as the Associate Director of Continuous School Improvement. Uh, that's my official title at CISA 9. Passionate about all things literacy. I'm letters trained, direct instruction trained. I've actually uh, dabbled in OG for many years and during the pandemic finally had the time to start some formal training in that. So that's been fun. Um, and, and so I've, I've taught second grade, um, Title I reading teacher. Be sure you mute. There we go. Um, Title I reading teacher for many years. So, so that's all kind of my background here. Still tutor students to help keep my teaching alive. That's very important to stay connected with students. So while I am familiar with the first, I and I've been using it with teacher groups this past school year, it is a new tool. And like all new tools, um, it's really important to recognize that there's a lot to learn about it. It's a big tool. There's a lot to think about. So some of the slides we'll use today are from DPI in their introduction of the first and others are ones that I've created uh, based on my work with teachers and also just unique for this presentation. So what I want you to know is this presentation is really not the final say in the first. Uh, it's a jumping off point. Um, we're going to look through these the details of the document and really give you a good grounding, but you're going to need to go back with yourself and with your team and dig into this document um, over and over again because there's a lot to unpack. So this session will provide you with um, the purpose of the first. It will do um, we will dig into the design of the first, and we'll talk about how you can use it with teachers and leaders in your setting. So I have shared the link to the slide deck. I'll throw it into the chat one more time for anybody who has come in late. Um, and you will need that today. In fact, you're going to want to make a copy of the, of the first document. So I have it open already, so I'm just going to go over to my document and I will click. Actually, I take it back. I'm going to share that in the. Um, it's there we go. Copy link. I'm going to put that into the chat as well. This is the public document that you're seeing on my screen and you do want to make a copy of this. So just go over to file, make a copy and make it your own because then you can type on it and you can make it really personalized when I'll ask you to do that uh, later in this today's session. Does anyone have any questions on how to do that, how to make a copy of this? I just, um, is there a way you could put it? Um, I'm on my phone. <laughs> so, um, cause my husband has the other computer, I have a desktop right now. What would you suggest for that? Um, are you, can I download it and email it to myself? Yeah, you can download it. You can email it to yourself. You can, I, I also recommend printing it. Um, I have a printed copy of it. It's much easier to process when you're reading it uh, in paper and you can take notes. So that's the other way to go. Uh, okay. It is about 40 pages long. So keep that in mind. Oh okay. dear. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a big document. <laughs> yeah. It's going to use some paper. Okay. So uh, any other questions on, on how to actually get to the first document? All right. Yes. Um, I'm not able to make a copy. Uh, that option is grayed out. Um, it should, so if you go over to the editing tools, this is the public copy that's available to everyone on the DPI, DPI website. Okay. So you just click on file where I am right here and scroll down to make a copy and click okay. And then it's going to um, open a new copy for you. Okay, thank you. And, you. and then you can just change the name up there and put your name or personalize it. Yep. Thanks. Okay, all right, no problem. Okay, 
So any other questions before we move on? It is important that you have the document. So I really do want to be sure everybody can access and look at it. Um, I'm actually, because of the permissions on my phone, I'm going to actually leave and log on on Facebook without a camera. Okay. So whatever you need someone, to do. Well, will someone be able to let me back in? The, the, the waiting room is disabled, so you'll be able to come back in at any time. All right. Thank you so much. No problem. Okay. So the standards for the, the new English language arts standards are also um, relevant here. And that link is on the PowerPoint. It's also, uh, you can find it by just Googling standards. Um, I do recommend that you familiarize yourself with the new 2020 standards. Uh, they have been revised. Um, I was fortunate to sit on the chair for the, or to chair the team for the foundational skills group. So that was um, a great experience. And um, you'll see that the first is directly tied to these um, foundational skill standards. So if you have not had a chance to look at the new standards, I recommend uh, checking in with your CISA. There will be, and it's okay if you haven't, because um, this was just the first year uh, of the rollout. It's a three-year rollout plan. So check in with your CISAs because they do offer um, learning around the new standards and unpacking them. We will offer more sessions at our CISA this year too. And then later on in our session, we'll do some breakout room activities where you can actually dig into the first a little more personally. Okay. So we're gonna start with this purpose building section. And again, if you have any questions, be sure to just type them into the chat or feel free to, we're a small group, you can interrupt and, and let me know and we can and tackle those. Okay. So this is a slide uh, that we use here at CISA 9 with our standards rollout, and it has to do with educational equity. Um, I'm just going to pause while you read that, the words in that yellow box. So when we think of the word access, we want to think about what does that mean for you in terms of um, closing the reading achievement gaps and, and a greater focus on the foundational skill standards and how we teach reading to students in kindergarten through grade two. What does the word access mean to you? You can either unmute or put your ideas in the chat. Either everyone's typing or you're being really quiet. <laughs> so educational access, what does that mean? To have the right resources at the right time. It's a big deal, right? We want to be sure that students are receiving instruction uh, with what they need and that the teachers are empowered with the knowledge that they need in order to um, move kids forward. Okay, so I'm just going to keep going for now. If you have ideas, I'll come back to them. So for Wisconsin, again, this is our purpose building. Oh, thank you so much. I didn't wait long enough. Resources at their level and teachers that are capable. That's right, Anne. No barriers. Yes, very good, Donna. Mm -hmm. and, there are, and we do, um, the thing about the first is it's a great way to help you process perhaps barriers that you might not be aware that you have in place. So that's a good segue into our next slide related to um, MLSS systems. So for Wisconsin schools implementing the multi-level systems of support, it means that we're providing services, practices, and resources to all students um, based on what they need, right? Effective instruction and intervention is key at all three tiers. So in this system, high quality instructional is systematic, which um, in my mind, and what you'll see reflected in the first, is that you must have a logical scope and sequence that you're working from. And, uh, and then it's also explicit. You're using strategic data, strategic use of data. Um, you're collaborating with your colleagues. You're interacting and facilitating student success together because it really does take a team. You'll see that in part five of the first, 
there's a couple pages dedicated to helping you review your MLSS system. So um, if that's a weakness in your school district or in your school, uh, I encourage you to really dig into part five and look at that MLSS system, those, those items. And we'll come back to that shortly. So again, the standards are a big deal um, and they are significant. There are significant and subtle changes to the standards. Uh, for example, if I scooch back to this document here, sorry if I'm gonna make a couple of you dizzy. There is a, um, scroll down quickly. There are new introduction sections to each strand of the standard built for teachers to understand what that strand is all about. So you wanna read the introduction to the, to the strand. Um, and then those changes, as we look at these foundational skills section here, they um, really have to do with um, reflecting decoding and encoding right within the foundational standards uh, for um, kindergarten through grade two. So you'll see nods to both spelling and reading in the foundational standards for phonics. And that's a big deal because prior to that, the spelling section was really dedicated only in the language strand. Um, so, so you'll see call outs to that language st strand as well. Um, important to note that not everything can be included in the standards, especially for foundational skills. Otherwise, they would be way too difficult to process. So the first actually provides more details than the standards alone, because the first is trying to flesh out those pieces that, um, that are, we couldn't necessarily include in the standards. So you really want to look at both and, and recognize the role that the first plays in helping fill in more detail specific to these foundational standards. All right, and you've got some other documents here that you can unpack. Just keep in mind that there's a three-year rollout plan in place and nothing will change in our state assessments for probably three to five years. So it'll take a while for that to make, to, for the um, test to come into a full alignment with the new standards. Um, okay, so let's dig into more of the purpose of the foundational reading skills tool. So this was developed, it is a by DPI. It is a self-assessment tool. And it's built on this vision of what it means to teach explicitly and systematically those foundational reading skills. Um, it has three big purposes. The first one is to operationalize that Wisconsin framework for teaching reading, meaning um, does your system include explicit systematic teaching of reading foundational skills? And what does that look like in place? How do you do it? So that first item is really about the how. Do you do it? And then how do you do it? The second purpose is to help school teams implement explicit and systematic foundational skills. So there's a systems look. Um, so you can look at it both from your teacher lens of the details you need to be effective and also from a systems lens. And then finally, kind of building on that systems idea, the third purpose is to help you monitor your growth over time. So you will be able to identify strengths in your current system, as well as areas in need of improvement, and then set tangible goals related to those targets. And all of this, of course, is based on teacher and leader feedback. So it's built around your system. Um, and you can, all right, so questions on that before I keep going. Okay. Thanks, Donna, for putting those items in the chat. I appreciate that. Okay, so this, this is just a summary slide for what the first is. It's a comprehensive tool for your school district or your school itself, depending on your situation. Um, we know that when students struggle with reading, there's often uh, times the issues have to do with a malfunction or an absence of one or more of the components necessary to make uh, a school system, a reading program or a reading system work across grade levels. So the premise that all components in this tool are necessary for successful reading comprehension 
that's important to recognize. Uh, we will tease it apart today and look at certain parts, but really you need to look at the document as a whole, and that's going to take time, uh, time to do, time to unpack. Um, the first is aligned with a few other documents. So the IES practice guide on foundational skills, which is a big, huge document, lots of detail about how to teach reading to K2. It's also aligned, of course, to the standards and you can use into the instructional practice guides um, created by DPI a couple of years back. Um, and it can be used with your school improvement review. School, so if you do the SIR in your district, um, you would want to dovetail the first with that and gather data around the same time. Question? So you're going to see the words explicit and systematic throughout this um, document. And I'm not going to show you this video. You can watch it on your own. It's a great video of Dr. Anita Archer explaining the why behind explicit instruction. Uh, it's current, so it's really a wonderful little five-minute video. Um, but basically, what she talks about is that explicit is to provide clear, memorable models followed by guided practice and positive corrective feedback. You want to use really precise language that enables students to complete that task successfully, uh, quickly, and, and immediately, rather than kind of working through uh, the discovery model. And she talks about a nice job of like, when is discovery appropriate? Not for new learning. <laughs> we want to be explicit uh, in our teaching of the foundational skills because it's difficult for many children to learn to read. And then um, the other term that's used frequently in this document is systematic. This term can be defined a lot of different ways, uh, but really truthfully what you're getting at is having a logical scope and sequence of these skills, cumulative review, and lots of practice. So if you're in a system where you don't have a clear scope and sequence, um, or if you have a scope and sequence, but it doesn't include places for cumulative review and practice, that's a problem as well. Um, so yeah, that's a point of reflection for you. Oops, pause that, okay, keep going. So the document, the first is built around the, the model representing the reading process. This was created by DPI. And before I explain this document, this image, we're going to actually look at its roots from Stahl and McKenna. Um, so here's this cognitive model. Think about reading comprehension. And Sharon Walpole does such a great, job of explaining this model. I'm just going to try to channel my inner Sharon here and think about um, these three funds as she talks them. They're, they're listed as pathways, but she talks about them as funds, F-U-N-D-S. So we have the automatic word recognition fund. And in order to be automatic, of course, the goal is to be fluent, but to be fluent, you have to be good at decoding words and you have to build up the sight word knowledge. And then in order to do that, you need to have your phonological awareness in place and your print concepts. So you can see how it's working backwards. If our goal is reading comprehension uh, and we, you have to keep bouncing back to get to the heart of how you can get kids to become automatic at their word recognition skills. They have to build these skills. So that's fun number one. Fund number two is the oral language, vocabulary, background knowledge, and text structures. This at K2 is often built through read-alouds. We're spending a lot of time reading rich language to students and getting to build, to build their background knowledge through those experiences. We're also building their, their abilities to follow along with the story and process it. So that's represented in the first as well, background knowledge building, vocabulary knowledge. And then this third pathway is about strategic knowledge. Um, how do we apply, how do we understand what we're reading? So you'll see items on the first reflected on these pieces as well. Um, your purpose for reading. Of course, at K2, it's much more narrow because they're still learning how to uh, decode and process text. Okay. All right. So let's, so that's the cognitive model from Stahl and his colleagues. We're gonna come back now and look at this model. Just double checking our muting on here. Be sure you are muted. Uh, 
Mary, can you click the mute all button on there? Just, just double check. I think there's one person who's not. I'm gonna keep going. Okay, so a model, so this is DPI's model and, and you can see that some added boxes are here, super important because that phonological foundational skills piece Um, I'm just going to pause here because I know I got muted too when she clicked mute at all. <laughs> so the, the, the blue boxes at the top are what the first really spends a lot of time on. And um, you can see the arrows pointing from left to right now. It sort of looks like it's a linear process, but we know that students bounce back and forth between these pieces as they're acquiring the skills. Language comprehension looks exactly the same as you saw on the other one with a few more details called out underneath. And we've got the strategic knowledge piece. Wrapped around this part is what I refer to as the art of teaching, right? So you as a teacher are creating interest and relevancy, choice and access, you're paying attention to the social emotional needs of kids. And most importantly, you're getting them to recognize when they don't get it, right? And do something about it. So those are all art of teaching skills and inside are those details of what you're teaching. So why do we use the first and who should use the first? First of all, there's two possible answers to this. School leaders should be using the first for their big picture planning to identify targets and professional learning based on teacher feedback. And then teachers need to use this. And while really part one is most important for teachers, though they should digest the full document, part one is all about the how of teaching reading. So this is where you can self-reflect, you can set personal goals, um, and those small details in your teaching are really what can create some high leverage changes and impact for students. So, and then together, notice the little knots here up together, there should be a cycle of communication happening between the teachers and the school leaders so that you're working together to move your system forward. So who should use it? Again, we talked about individual teachers, and this would be all teachers who work with K-2 as well as special ed, reading teachers, EL teachers, interventionists, um, because what you're looking from the K-2 lens, but these other teachers are going to also look from the struggling reader lens and think about their practices and how to move kids forward. Grade level teams can use this, literacy teams. Uh, district leadership teams, literacy coaches, all of these groups here, curriculum review teams might find this document helpful, um, as well as school improvement teams. You will need to decide who is going to gather and summarize the survey data and how are you going to create those action and steps. So it's one thing to use the document by yourself or with a team. It's another piece to actually move and set targets and put things in place um, over time. So in the introduction matter of the first, uh, the, the designers of it um, from DPI suggest that you would use this one time in its entirety during the school year. So you might have those leadership teams, for example, complete the entire document in the spring of the year, in the summer or possibly mid-year when you're doing your SIR information. Um, but that's the goal to do the whole thing just one time per year. Uh, so as a school leader, you'd think about who should be doing it um, and when, and then how are they gonna gather the data? Uh, you can see that this is just a Google Doc, right? I think if they were me and I was in my old job as a district reading specialist, I would, turn this into a Google form so that I could gather the data uh, more efficiently from teachers rather than um, collating it individually. So uh, that's just a thought for you is possibly turn it into a Google form. Um, teachers, however, like in the classroom, in the nitty gritty, you might want to be looking at part one and just tackling a couple sections at a time and setting some goals for yourselves on your teaching. So, and of course, these really shouldn't be happening in isolation. There should be um, communication between the team leaders, but 
it is a lot to process. So I think um, when I have used this with teachers, uh, teacher teams this past school year, we just did a few pages at a time. For some, some of that was because of time constraints and others and other parts of it were because it's so much. So we can only take in a little bit at a time, right? Okay, so do you have questions on who should use the document and when they should use the document? Trying to get better at my wait time. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you for waiting, actually, because I needed to get back to my screen and I'm dual screening it here. Um, so what would you say for a teacher? Because I think a lot of us are in this boat um, that um, uh, not everyone is on board with the science of reading. I've been trying to do just like many, like teaching them like the fizzle rule at our PLC meetings. I've tried to bring it to the school. I've tried to bring it to the district. I'm not gaining any traction. So I guess for me doing this individually, is this worthwhile? Because um, I, I think, think I'm kind ahead. of on an island. We have no systematic we have no systems in place. So I try to be systematic when I'm teaching it in second grade, but I don't know really what they're coming with. I don't know where they're going. So uh, what would you suggest? Cause I think a lot of people are in this boat. Maybe I'm wrong. So the document is not nowhere on this document. Do you see the term science of reading listed number one? And number two, it's, it's listed very, um, it's written to, to align with the evidence that supports the teaching of reading. And as you dig into the document, you will see that it honors quite a bit of um, what, what, teach, what your colleagues value. That, um, so I do think that this is a, a very safe document to put in front of your leaders and your colleagues because it's thoughtful and reflective and it's not saying you must do this or it's 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 not forcing a view it's really just about best practice so i i do think that um i would encourage you to pull this out with your team and just begin with your grade level team and not not put it under the lens of science of reading but just to put it under the lens of hey we're all in this together and we really need to help move our students forward especially in this year after the pandemic where kids had such interrupted instruction so i hope that helps you in some way yes, yes thank you mm -hmm. Okay, so let's look at the design of the first, and I think that will also shed some light on, on how it can be used with colleagues. So there are six components to the first. Um, part one is dedicated to instructional practice. So if I were bringing this to my colleagues, this would be the section that I would want to look at and, and just have us reflect on individually um, and then as a group, like where are our needs? What do we think kids need? So part one begins on page 11. It's the longest section of the first. It focuses on those instructional practices. It's the how to teach section. Um, and I'm just gonna open it up here so you can see that. We're gonna scroll down. There's a lot of internal matter. Um, so pretty much everything that I've said so far is in that intro matter, along with all those links. Here's the beginning of part one. Do we use research-based and evidence-based instructional practices when teaching foundational skills? And then it goes through the questions. It's asking everything in a question in phonological processing instruction, instructional practice in general. Now that, that term, I'm gonna unpack that in just a minute, is might be a stop right there. <laughs> People are like, what does that even mean? So we'll talk about that in just a minute. But as you look at the questions, those are, you know, create a classroom environment that's print rich and incorporates tools and scaffolds to support learning and transfer, including digital tools. It's a pretty, pretty safe item. LOI stands for level of implementation. And then we have evidence of support for that item. So this is just looking broadly, this first section, 
Um, ensure that 50% or more of instructional time intentionally includes application of skills taught across learning settings to promote transfer. So 50% of our time should be on transferring of skills. 50% should be on instruction. The other 50% should be on transfer. Um, so that first section is sort of big picture items on the how. Provide five to 18 hours of phonemic awareness instruction as recommended by the National Reading Panel um, and so on. So then we get into oral language. This is why we wanna do this in chunks and not all at once. So items related to read alouds. Read aloud to make deposits in students' linguistic storehouse, including their lexicon or vocabulary. So do you see how putting this in front of a broad group of teachers, there's a lot of you know, things that we relate to, no matter what your philosophy of teaching is, this is, uh, this is going to connect. Um, print concepts, right? Use shared reading to help teach the, about concepts about print. Um, use the closed technique. Now, maybe some of us don't know what that closed technique is, where you leave a word out and, uh, and students are using meaning to help figure out. Now that isn't uh, a decoding strategy, that's a language strategy. So that's important to recognize when you would use the closed technique as a language building strategy. Um, model finger tech tracking <clears throat> while reading out loud so kids can see that sweep of left to right and that every word matters when we're reading. Okay. So I'm just previewing this very part, first section for you. There's the phonological awareness section um, with links on blending and segmenting, and then the phonemic awareness section, because of course that's a broad term, phonological awareness. And then we've got the actual phonemes, the sounds and details about that, okay? So again, tackling just one section at a time, maybe you use Hegarty and you wanna look at this phonemic awareness and phonological awareness section in relationship to your use with the Hegarty resource. Or maybe you have something else that you're using to teach those skills with and you wanna use this to help see if what you're doing in whatever, however you're teaching PA aligns with what's here on the first. So it's a way to help you look for that evidence and, and determine where you might have needs, keeping in mind that the standards are called out um, when, when there is a direct link. And also that there's pieces on here because the standards alone are not enough, there's other pieces that you wanna keep um, considering. Okay, so we just keep going. The alphabetic principle, uh, letter formation, and here's phonics uh, and so on. So, Orthography, so this is getting into the spelling component, the decoding and encoding relationship. Orthography just means print, um, so that's important. And then morphology, that's the meaning of words, that's the vocabulary piece, which it seems like, I'm not gonna teach morphology to my kindergartners, but when you look here, there are things that we, you know, we do teach kids how prefixes and ing is a suffix. So we're talking about seeing and looking and spending and playing. So um, redoing something, rereading, those are prefixes and suffixes that are appropriate for uh, kindergartners and first graders to be processing. So you think about this through the lens of what's appropriate for a primary student. There's vocabulary and of course the links. You can see the language standards called out here for vocabulary development um, and fluency. By the way, uh, just to nod back to the standards, um, if we go down to the appendix on the standards way at the end, th that has been revised and we added a very comprehensive definition of fluency, which you'd wanna unpack with your colleagues because it's really the most comprehensive definition um, that we were able to assemble, the team and I. So fluency um, and the three components of fluency are called out specifically, and you'll see those here on the first in age appropriate ways. So with nods to the specific um, standards. And then we get to this thing called interrelated instructional strategies, and this is modeling, um, you know, language for students. So this is a lot to unpack, right? You can't do this in a single sitting and really <laughs> keep your head straight. <laughs> you want to unpack this slowly and think about the, the, the components and set some tangible goals uh, for yourself. So that's just part one. Um, 
instruct the instructional practices, the how to teach, and breaking it down into those separate components. Then we get into part two, which is the phonological processing as part of a complex system. Um, I'm just going to overview these quickly. This is the what to teach, um, thinking about reading broadly, what to teach in terms of a complex system in your language art system. Part three is high quality instructional materials. It's just a single page to help you think through five or six components about high quality instructional materials. Part four is dedicated to data. It's a two pager on formative and summative data practices. And of course, we can't talk about data without thinking about that multi-level systems of support. So there's a page on that. And the last section is related to leadership and organizational structures. So um, this is gonna help your principals, your literacy coaches, those people that, are, that support teachers think from a systems lens on what they need to do to help move you forward. So I see some questions in the chat. Um, high quality, <laughs> could someone please define high quality? Well, Ed Reports likes to define high quality, so that's a place to, to think about. Um, and, and I think if you look at part three, so if you're looking at defining high quality and we go to part three, you can see what the first is doing. Do we utilize high quality materials? And there are um, several items on here that help you tease through what high quality means, okay? Uh, I do think that there is absolutely, um, it's important to think about your scope and sequence here and how logical it is and how much cumulative review. Uh, Ed reports is insufficient when it comes to looking at, um, this is just my opinion here, so I'll be careful with that. When it comes to thinking about the foundational skills, because they're basing it primarily on the standards and the standards are, as we've said, are not robust enough to include all of the details that, um, that you need to consider. So just keep that in mind. When, a, when something gets a high mark or a low mark, you wanna dig into um, the why behind that and you need to be smarter than your resource and smarter than Ed reports uh, in terms of evaluating. So, okay, I'll just jump off my soapbox there. Um, so let's unpack that term phonological processing. It's actually in the glossary of the first on page 41. So just crash course on the brain. On the left side of the brain, that's our language processing center. We're not hardwired to read, um, but we are hardwired to speak. So uh, the phonological processing center is tapped into anytime you're doing things with language, speaking and or reading and writing. Uh, and of course we have to build those pathways for reading and writing. So when you see that term phonological processing peppered throughout the first, I want you to think of the comprehensive uh, components necessary for learning to read. So we have that language center, we have um, being able to, so orthographic is looking at the print and recognizing letters and words, connecting those sound symbols with phonics, and of course, continuing to develop uh, the meanings of words. So all parts of the brain have to function here on the left side in order for us to become readers. And, we, and we're literally building these pathways for kids. And the first is looking at the evidence and trying to capture some of those details for you that need to be in place in order for kids to learn to read. So, um, the first asks you, I'm just gonna pause again and see if there's questions because I know I've just dumped a whole bunch of stuff on you. So pause here. Okay. All right, we're gonna keep going. Feel free to put your question in the chat. So what are those levels of implementation? So this is right from DPI, as you can see, and this is captured um, early in the introduction matter. There's descriptions of these not in place, purpose building, infrastructure, initial implementation, full implementation. Okay, so when you so what DPI is asking you to do is to look at an item on the first and decide, okay, is this not in place at all? We would put NIP. 
Um, is this an item that we need to build some purpose around? What is the why behind this item? I put a PB there. Infrastructure would be, we have started to do this uh, and we need to be um, thinking about what needs to be supported for teachers. Do they need more training in this? Do they need, uh, do we need to put some literacy coaches in place or uh, what needs to happen in terms of the infrastructure uh, and to support this piece? Maybe we need to think about the schedule, for example. Uh, maybe that's a barrier for something not working. Yep, I'm just looking at my notes. The printed copy is so useful. So the infrastructure piece, my notes say it's capacity building. This is on page seven of the document. Um, schedules. So lots of things when we think about when something doesn't work in a school, when kids are not making growth, Sometimes it's not about the resources that we're using, but it's about the schedule, right? It's about the other things that are getting in the way and preventing. For example, if you only have 10 minutes of time for your small group instruction, well, that's not enough time. So uh, that could be what's holding you back, uh, the number of minutes dedicated to your small group. And then we get into initial implementation. And this is where um, you're thinking about that awkward phase when we first try something new and you were disrupting our old habits and we're having to have some accountability on trying on something that might be not what we've done in the past and working through that. This is sort of that, that growth phase where you're identifying the target, you're, imp you're initially implementing it and you're recognizing it's different from what you used to do. So um, that's a piece that we, are, we could be at. And then of course, finally, full implementation. But even under full implementation, we have to guard against falling back into old habits. So that would be the, you know, what's the check for accountability on, and it could be personal, like do, am I, oh, I used to do this practice and I completely forgot about it. I'm gonna just remind myself that I need to, that I need to bring this back in because uh, I let it go for whatever reason. So that, those are the levels of implementation and they're outlined very detailed on page seven. Um, and I do think that school leaders and even teachers could use those levels of implementation. Uh, when I use this with teachers in my setting, because we, it was wrapped around other learning, um, we just did something a little more basic. And I asked teachers to read an item and put a plus if they totally did it. Like, yep, I know what this is. I do it. I can identify where in my schedule I do it and what I'm using it with. They got a plus. If they knew what it was but didn't do it, it may be because it wasn't appropriate for their grade or um, their group of students that they had didn't need that anymore, then they got a minus. And of course, the question mark, either I don't know what this is or I'm not sure uh, where it's done either way. And if depending on what your why your question mark is there, you'd want to give yourself a little annotation uh, as to why you put the question mark there. So that is how I had teachers do part one, they read through a couple sections and did a plus a minus or a question mark. And we digested that a bit. So that's a very friendly way to do it. If I'm looking at this from um, goal setting, and I'm a district leader, and I'm a, or I'm a grade le team leader, uh, then I'm, I'm going to want to try to use these pieces because this, the technical, um, you know, terms here are going to help you set really clear goals, right, F from a systems perspective. So just a reminder, again, you're doing, you want your teams to do this whole thing one time a year, uh, but you can do small chunks of it throughout the year to focus your learning. And maybe at the beginning of the year, you do all of part one as a grade level team. And then you go back and you decide, huh, I, I think we need to focus on this section because it's an area of weakness for us as a team or as an individual. That takes some, some guts too, to recognize what you're good at. And also to say, I need some help in this section or my students need some help in this section. So we have to be willing to be vulnerable with ourselves and with each other. And that can also be hard for some of us for sure. Okay, so be inclusive. Um, we talked about this. I just included the slide from, it can be used for a building wide audit as well. Uh, in case you didn't catch that, this is also listed in the document. Um, sometimes that's the place to start. So for the teacher who said, we don't, we're not where we need to be and I'm sort of on an island, maybe you suggest to your 
leadership that you want to try uh, using the document is to help support a building wide audit of your literacy curriculum and your process. So this is a big document, little bites do work. We're going to dig into it right now. Um, I'm going to put you into some breakout rooms, but before we do that, you already have your cameras off. I do just want to give you a couple of minutes to um, either read the front matter. My friend, my colleague, Casey, um, she was like, I have to know the front matter before I can go any further. And so she had to read pages three through six before she could process anything else. I, on the other hand, was like, I'll come back to that. And I just jumped into part one. Um, so maybe that's what you want to do. Or maybe you're, those terms are really freaking you out and you want to look at the glossary. Um, that's an option as well. So I just want to give you a couple of minutes to scroll through the document. Um, and then we're going to actually come back and do a couple activities and unpack parts of it. So I'll just turn my camera off for a few minutes. Mary, if you want to pause the recording here to process. I hope that was a little bit of time for you to process the, um, the document just a little bit, and we're going to actually dig in a little more. Does anyone have any questions or wonderings about or connections to things you read in that time? Okay, we're going to keep going then. Okay, so I said we'd spend some time on the how of instructional practice. Um, and I, what I've done here, we're going to do a breakout room activity. I'm going to show you the activity first. And I'm going to have you think about the phoneme awareness section on pages 15 and 16. And you're going to look at the items that I've called out and you're going to think about the item in terms of is this item related to instructional sequence or is it more of an art of teaching piece and of course there's some judgment involved with that. So these are eight of the items that I've pulled out. Um, I'll give you a hint in that um, not very many are art of teaching, but there are a few. So think about uh, think about that and what you'll do is just copy and paste into each of the boxes as a team deciding if something represents instructional sequence and best practice or if something is more art of teaching. So that is the first task that I'll ask you to do and um, I think I'm going to introduce both tasks with you at the same time. The second task is related to the phonics section on pages 18 through 20. So you'll read the items and you'll think about, and maybe you wanna do this one instead. So I'll give you a choice because we're only gonna do this for 10 minutes, okay? So you can either choose to do the phonemic awareness exercise or you can choose to maybe think about this one instead. So here are seven items from pages 18 through 20 related to the teaching of phonics. And here are what you would do with them. So which items move from letter sound work to decoding and encoding words to sounding them out and spelling words, okay? So which items are like that? Which items move from word parts or the whole word back to letter sound analysis? So, so we're going from whole to part in number two, we're going from part to whole in number one. And then finally, in which items are phonemic awareness skills most important, okay? So in these items here, numbers one, two, and three, you will find some of these apply to more than one, okay? All right, so I'm gonna give you about 10 minutes and you can choose which activity you would like to do. You wanna probably will not have time to do both in 10 minutes, but you have this slideshow with you and you can, um, you can choose to, um, just going to copy the link to this to do this with colleagues. Um, this is a great activity to do with colleagues. So I'm going to put this in the chat for everyone. You all have the ability to share your screen with, uh, so somebody can choose to share the screen with each other and, uh, and work through it. So does anyone have any questions about the task that you're about to do together as a team? Did I see people jumping on to, um, to this one. Okay. So, and I believe that it's set to edit. Just double check that, that you can edit. No, I'm going to change that. So just refresh your page and you'll be able to edit. 
Okay. Um, let me just, I'm going to pause my screen here. Well, actually, no, let's go right to breakout rooms. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So we will do. Um, I'd like you to be in about groups of four. So there we go. All right. Um, and then you can you'll see room one, room two, room three. You can just go to group one, group two, group three. That's the way that'll work. Any questions before I send you off to the breakout room? I can't see you because you all have your cameras off, so I can't read your faces or ask for thumbs up. But um, question? No, feeling okay. All right, I'm going to open those up. Feel free to, I know that uh, that probably was barely enough time to do one of those tasks. Um, and I was watching your, your progress here. So this group that did, um, that did the phonemic awareness exercise. You were going back and forth and sorting out. And yes, the art of teaching, keep phonemic awareness, instruction brief, simple and fun, include multi-sensory games, songs, students' names. That's definitely more of the art of teaching piece. And then you've got this instructional sequence. Anytime you see model and practice, you're looking at instruction, right? Provide explicit instruction, identifying and isolating initial, final, and medial sounds. Um, discriminate phonemes based on position in the word, right? So those are instructional techniques that you want to employ. Um, so nice job on that. Questions or wonderings about this particular task, this one? All right, the other task was related to um, phonics. And this was looking either uh, part to whole, letter sound to decoding and encoding words, or whole to part, looking at the word and teasing out the, the sounds that you'd need to write to. Um, okay, so, and then the last part was in which items are phonemic awareness skills most important. So you could put the numbers down here underneath this yellow box, or you could do what these guys were working on, which was to, I'm looking for where you wrote your answers in. Yes, you put your answers in. Um, provide opportunities to apply letter sound knowledge to decode and encode familiar words, moving from part to whole. That's right. Um, and you've got some of the other ones. Instruct students in common sound spelling patterns. Uh, so phonogram lists, word building, word sorts, this really it would be both because you need to both decode and encode the words to do common sound spelling patterns is going to be the part, but putting it together in words and word sorts would be whole to part. So both. Mm -hmm. Teach students to use single syllable patterns to develop syllabic analysis, um, part to whole, right? Single syllable patterns, to syllabic analysis, yep. Um, teach regular and irregular high frequency words so that students can map speech to print. Uh, and yes, that would be both, um, but you do, you wanna be sure that they are very carefully analyzing that word, not, rec not memorizing it by shape, not memorizing it by um, just looking at it visually, but actually associating the print, the speech with the actual printed letters. So it's both. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I do have that particular slide. I put in the answers here for you. Um, so you can see where there's overlap here. Um, two, three, four, and six are part to whole, and one, two, four, five, and seven are whole to part. And then of course that last question was a trick question. Um, phonemic awareness is important for all of these to be a good reader and speller. Um, you'd need to have very well developed phonemic awareness. So all of them are important. Okay. All right, questions on this piece. So in summary, um, I know that we had our, okay, thanks. Thanks for letting me know you have to go. Um, in summary, you need to, 
hopefully you can answer these questions, right? What is the verse? How is it organized? And it has six sections. Who should use it? Um, how often? How often here? How often? How often should uh, teachers use it? Well, they should also use the whole document once per year, but they might want to piece out how they're approaching it to make it really actionable for them. Um, how do you gonna, how do you want to score it? Are you going to really tackle those LOIs as they're listed, or do you want to do the plus, minus, and question mark? And really, that depends on your audience. Uh, and how are you going to tally the results? Do you want to turn it into a Google form? One thing that I will show you, um, here's my copy of this document. Nope, that's not my copy. Oh, I closed my copy. Uh, what I did on mine was um, I, we numbered, when we were analyzing this at our CISA, we numbered all of these. So you can see numbering here. It's really important. No, this is my copy. It's really important because then you can just go, all right, item 120, let's talk about that. And you can all find it very quickly versus saying page seven, it's the third one down from the top. You don't want to do that. You want to number. This is the fourth. Okay. So bouncing back here. Um, how often do you plan to return to this document? So if you I recommend if you're doing this with grade level teams that you select a PLC time maybe once a month to or to tackle something on here and that you return to your previous set goals and maybe then you decide when it's ready to set new ones. Um, and what does that accountability look like? Who decides what your evidence is and how, and how are you going to record that? So these are questions that some of these you need to tackle as a team and others we've answered today based on the slides that we've been through. So ladies and gentlemen, with that, we have reached the end of our session. I'm going to pause here and see if you have any questions that you want to bring to the group and if others have ideas and that they would like to share. Mona, it's good to see your little screen in there. Oh, I'll pause. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say I'm really glad that um, Wisconsin is recognizing the need for this and that we can all get on the same page. I, I think it's going to be a daunting task. I mean, it's just, this is so new for people. And, you know, I, I don't know, you know, three years is a long time to roll it out. I would like to see it done yesterday, you know. <laughs> You know, so three years is for the standards. Three years is for the standards, uh, well, not for this document. Yeah. But even so, um, you know, as you know, Amy, you know, the CSEs are just starting to even recognize the need for this. And so we've got, you know, we've got two CSEs out of 12 that are on board. We've got a long way to go. And um, I don't know how that process can be, um, you know, accelerated, but you know, it's, it's a start and I appreciate the people that did show up today or the people that are going to watch this recording because, um, you know, our, our Wisconsin Science of Reading and Task Force site, as well as the Reading League are instrumental in getting this message out to people. And um, it's real critical that we, that we keep spreading the message and spreading the news. And I can tell you that having used this document with teachers, it, there's so much to unpack that it's really important um, to thank you, CISA 5. I'm glad you're using this work as well, Don, right. that you're here. Um, uh, it's just really super important to to take the time to unpack the terms like what do they mean what do, what do these items mean because I think it's very overwhelming teachers get really stuck and bogged down in the weeds and um, you know just to uh, to build the capacity to really process this, this is important. Takes well time. I agree and it you know the terminology is so new even though you've heard it do you really understand it? It takes time. It takes mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. so. And that's where the goal setting is so useful here because in, in, in the willingness to be vulnerable and to, to say, you know what, I think I know what this means, but, I, but I'm not entirely sure, or I need some more information on that, or um, what does that look like in practice, and, and not, not to be afraid to, to say that, to be vulnerable with yourself and with your colleagues, and that maybe there's more to know on, on some parts of reading that, uh, you know, you overlooked or, or, didn't, or never taught, maybe. So for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thanks, Amy. Nice, nicely done. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, comments, or wonderings? Um, are we going to have future events that tag onto this? Uh, we certainly could if, if people are interested in doing other more learning around the first uh, or um, DPI does have a webinar series related to the foundational skills that the first one is about the first includes information on the first. Um, they're, they're basic, but they're useful as a jumping off point, especially for newer teachers. So uh, mm -hmm. that's not a bad thing to, to explore. Um, and all of the CESAs will, you know, are continuing to provide training and work around this as well, as well as lots of other um, learning opportunities uh, across the state too in the country that um, so many are available for, for free or for low cost now to help build your learning. Donna, you do a great job on your site <laughs> sharing those out with you. With folks. Um, you know, that IES stuff is just amazing. It is mm -hmm. so amazing. I really encourage you all to look at that. Um, and I was planning on doing some sort of unpacking of that in the future, you know, because you can look at that site and go, whoa, there's so much, but unless you really dig into it, and I thought it would be kind of a fun activity to dig into that with some people. So look forward to that. I'm going to be doing that in the Science of Reading site. Yeah, they, there are some really great resources on the IES site for foundational skills. Highly recommend looking, and some great video modeling too. Oh my gosh, um, it's mm -hmm. so awesome. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, the Tennessee Foundational Skills Curriculum, also supplemental curriculum, also has some really great modeling of, of many of the things you see on the first. So that's another great resource to consider. Wonderful. I'll put that up. Um, mm -hmm. Did you put that in this document, the Tennessee? No, no but, I, but I can. I can add it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, because that, you know, the more we can share out the more, you know, we'll share the, mis the mission, so. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, thanks everyone baby. for joining me on this Tuesday morning. Yeah. <laughs>